All right. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the morning that we've had. Thank you for the chance to worship you. Thank you for the reminder we just had from Josh that our hope and our security doesn't come from our circumstances or, or what's happening in the world or who's in charge of a government. Our ultimate hope and security comes from you and what you've provided and what you've promised. We thank you that we have the privilege to live in that security. Lord, be with us now as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a, as Josh mentioned, it's kind of an awkward time of the year. I normally preach series. I normally preach all the way through books. We, um, we finished Mark that took us about a year and a half to get through, and then uh, we went through kind of a purpose of the church thing, and now we're at odds, and I don't want to start something new now. Uh, last week, we, I made a challenge for myself last week. I was like, what is the most boring part of the Christmas story? And I preached on that. And according to my kids, we managed to make it not boring. So I, I'm, I'm clocking that as a win. We did Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, the genealogy of Christ. And, uh, and we managed to get through that and maybe learn a few things. We're actually going to pick up right after that. We're in Matthew chapter 1 again. If you don't have a Bible, there's a bunch on that back shelf. And if you need a Bible, just take it. We got boxes of the things. You can just have one. It's fine. But we have a bunch of them on that back shelf. You're welcome to grab one if you want to have one this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to be starting in verse 18. And let me just go ahead and, and start this. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with the child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, decided to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For that has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until the day she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. Now the, the basics of what's going on here, let's just cover the, the scene. Um, Mary is pregnant and Joseph knows it wasn't him because Joseph is a righteous man and they're only engaged. They're not married, and they're not supposed to do that yet, and they haven't because he's a righteous man. And Mary's pregnant. And we get, I could preach a whole sermon on this. This, this isn't what the sermon is about, but we learn a great deal about Joseph's personality and who he is just from these short little verses. Because he's a righteous man, and yet oftentimes in people we find one of two things. We find self-righteous people who are then very judgmental of other people. Or we find some people that don't have very high personal standards and they're pretty okay with you doing whatever you want eat also. But what we find here is a very righteous man who's also compassionate. What we find here is a very righteous man who cares about this woman. He doesn't know why she's pregnant. Right now, the only thing he can possibly imagine is that he sinned. she has sinned against him, and yet he isn't vengeful. He doesn't go after her. He doesn't try to humiliate her in public. She doesn't, he doesn't do any of that stuff. Even though the, the only thing that he can think of at this point is that she's cheated on me, he tries to be as kind and as gracious and protective of her as he can, even as he's considering putting her away and saying, no, I can't marry you. That's not going to happen. But I'm not going to do it in a mean way. We find out about the kindness of Joseph in comparison with his righteousness, that he, that he had those two traits just from these few words. It's a wonderful little picture into this man we actually know very little about. But that's not actually what I want to drill in on today. I want to drill on 
something that bothered me as a kid. And maybe it bothers you, or maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I, I get bothered by things really easily. I expect things to work. And here's what happens. This angel appears to Joseph in a dream. Because that's pretty much the only way he's going to be convinced that Mary didn't cheat on him. Something pretty drastic is going to have to happen for him to not think Mary cheated on him. And so an angel appearing, that's pretty drastic. And an angel shows up to talk to him, explain the situation. But in the process, that angel says, you're going to name him Jesus. Check. By the way, Jesus is not a good phonetic way of saying what the angel said. Uh, I, I'm not a big person for trying to say things Jewish. I sometimes feel like that's a little pretentious. In this particular case, I do want to kind of bring it out. The word the angel said was something like Yeshua. My Hebrew pronunciation isn't awesome, but it's, it was something like Yeshua, which sounds more like Joshua. It should because it is more like Joshua because that's the name, Joshua. The angel said, you'll name him Joshua. The same name as Joshua from, you know, the book, Joshua. The reason we call him Jesus is because we've anglicized it so that uh, he won't be confused with the other Joshua and so that when we say the name Jesus, there's only one name. And so when and our translators have decided to take that name and make it special, but the truth of the matter is, the angel said, name him Joshua. We just said Jesus. That's a weirdness to me. But that's the way it is. And, and the convention's way too, way too far for me to fix it, that or change that. And then if you skip down, if you keep reading. So that's in verse 21. In verse 21, the angel says, you're going to call his name Jesus. For it is he who is going to save his people from the sins. We're going to get to why that makes any sense in a second. And then in verse 22, it says, now all this took place. So that what was spoken by the Lord to the prophet might be fulfilled. And it talks about a virgin, check. It talks about a son, check. And then it says, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. I don't know about you, okay? Joshua sounds nothing like Emmanuel to me. I don't get on the surface why calling him Jesus fulfills the prophecy that he would be called Emmanuel. That doesn't immediately make any sense to me whatsoever. Not only that, the word Emmanuel is not used in the New Testament after that. He is never actually called Emmanuel. So, so this is a problem to me. These are the sort of questions I have. And, and I think a lot of people have these questions. We just don't talk about them because we don't want to break the Bible and we, we're afraid that if we talk about it, then no one will have a good answer. We just blow over it. And I worry, though, that because we don't actually talk about it, we don't have a good answer. That when other people read this, they're going to do the same thing. And you know what? Go, well, maybe I just don't think this Bible thing is worth anything. If it's this broken, that Jesus and Emmanuel don't even match and they're only two verses away from each other. Well, the truth of the matter is, I don't think it's broken. We're going to get to that. In fact, it makes beautiful, wonderful sense. But in order for it to make beautiful, wonderful sense, we, we have to understand something that is hard for us to understand. And this will make a big difference in the rest of what we're going to talk about this morning. See, Matthew was Jewish. Uh, most of you, that's not a big surprise. And the book that Matthew wrote was specifically to Jewish people to explain to Jewish people why the Messiah that they had been promised over and over and over, there's so many things about the Messiah, and that the Messiah that they were promised had come. It was written to Jewish people who knew Hebrew and who thought in a very specific way. They had Jewish logic, not Greek logic. And we're in the West, and we're the descendants of the Greeks, and we think in a very specifically Greek logical manner that the Jews did not think in. This book makes total sense to them, less sense to us. But if we're going to understand this, we kind of have to put our Jewish hat on. We have to think like a Jew. We have to consider who it was written to before we can really start to grasp what it says and why. And it's one of the hardest parts, really, about reading the Bible. It's, it's taking a moment to consider 
what did the original people that got this message think? What did they see? What did they hear? How did it impact their life? Because that's really where we dig into the truth of what God was trying to say. Because it had to mean something to the first person that heard it. Whatever that was, that's probably the best meaning we can get. One of the things that would have happened to the person that read this that was Jewish is that Yeshua wouldn't just be a name. The original audience that read this wouldn't just read Yeshua. They would read God saves because that's what it means. And every person who read this of the original audience spoke Hebrew and read Hebrew. They all did, and they all knew exactly what Yeshua meant. It wasn't just a name. It was a phrase, God saves. So when they read this, this is what they read in verse 21. And she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name God saves, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Oh, well, that makes much more sense now. You'll name him God saves because he will save people from their sins. That makes sense. Well, the truth of the matter is, is if I went out to to somebody out here in in Exmouth and I had like a roaming reporter with a microphone, I said, what do you think Jesus means? I don't think anybody would be able to tell me. They'd, They'd be able to tell me kind of who Jesus was. They certainly wouldn't be able to tell me what the name means. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people in churches They could not in any given moment tell me what Jesus' name means either. So part of what I'm going to try to do this morning, we're going to go through some of the things that Jesus has been called and what they actually mean. And in that discovering what they mean, maybe discover better truth about who Jesus is. Here's some of the things that Jesus has been called. He's been called many things. This is a sampling. He's been called Jesus. Then there's this one aspect of Emmanuel. We'll get to that later. He's been called um, the second Adam. That's an interesting title. He's been called the Son of God. He's been called Logos, the Word. He's been called the Son of Man. Those are some interesting things to be called, and we're going to look at what those things mean this morning and see how they fit together to explain who Jesus is. I'm catching up with where I am. Just a second. So let's go back to verse 21. And he will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will be the one who saves his people from their sins. That's a pretty churchy word, isn't it? Sins? Does anyone outside of a church use the word sin much? Probably not. Anyone have a clue where the word sin came from? I know. You might know. Yes. Yes. So that's perfect. That's exactly it. I'm going to explain that for everybody who couldn't hear that. When the, the concept that's in the, the book here, we tend to think of sin as bad things, which isn't exactly the concept. When they were trying to find an English word to describe the concept that's actually in the Bible that's written, they were grasping for something that would adequately explain it. And they came up with, they borrowed an archery term. And here's what would happen. The archer would be there, and he's aiming at the bullseye, way over there. And he fires at the bullseye. And he misses the bullseye. Clunk. That's a sin. Here's what a sin is not. Sin is not failing to show up to the archery range at all. Fritz, this is, sin is not turning and shooting your neighbor. Sin isn't even lying about your score. Sin is trying to be perfect and failing. I'm going to say that again. Sin is the attempt to be perfect and failing. 
which is not how we often think of sin or talk about sin or consider sin. But when the first translators were trying to get what's actually written by these people and give it a concept and a name that accurately described it, they took this to help us understand that. But you see, none of us are archers anymore, and we don't have these customs anymore. We don't use the word sin, and, and, our, and so we've lost it. We've lost the original context of the word, and yet by tradition we continue to use the word sin because that's what's happened. But it's a really important that we grab onto an idea that sin is trying to be perfect and failing at it. Now here's the crazy thing that's suggested by verse 21. Because it really is odd sounding. Read the end of it with the meaning in place. For it is he who will save his people from trying to be perfect and failing. That's what Jesus came to save us from. He came to save us from trying to be perfect and failing at it. It's a different thought. Believe it or not, this idea that imperfection is deadly isn't confined to Christianity. Let me give you some examples. Hindus and Buddhists believe what? Well, we live a life. And if we live that life imperfectly, we die. We get to try again. And if we live life imperfectly, we die. And we get to try again. And if we live life perfectly, we die. And we get to try again. See, the Buddhists and the Hindus get it that imperfection leads to death. The Muslims, the Muslims have a very, very strict standard that they don't keep. I've never met a Muslim in my life that actually kept the standards of the Quran, and yet the Quran is very clear. If you don't keep the standards, you go to hell. There's no forgiveness. Islam is not a forgiving God. Be perfect or die. Even secular humanists believe this. Really? Watch this. Would not a secular humanist say that if my physical body was perfect, if it didn't naturally degrade, if I ate perfectly, if I drank perfectly, if we had a perfect community where people didn't kill each other, if we perfectly managed the planet, if we perfectly did everything, mankind wouldn't have to die. Why do people die? Because we're not perfect. If we were perfectly perfect, Human beings wouldn't die. Even secular humanists understand imperfection causes death. The fact of the matter is, if we were really to think about it philosophically, we'd realize almost everyone on the planet has determined imperfection causes death. And we have no cure. We are all imperfect. This is our problem. This is our state. This is our status. This is where we live. We live as an entire planet of imperfect people and our imperfections lead to death. Sometimes gruesome, ugly, nasty deaths and sometimes old person in their bed deaths and all different kinds of deaths. But our imperfections, whatever they might be, lead to death. Jesus came to save us from that fate. Jesus came to save us from the penalty of imperfection. That's what verse 21 says. And it's not often how we talk about the process or the reason for Christ. Another name that Jesus has been called more recently is the second Adam. We get that from a place, from a couple different places in the Bible, but let's turn to the book of Romans, if you will. Chapter 5, verse 12. Why would we call Jesus the second Adam? <coughs> well, here's the first Adam. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 talks about the first Adam. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered 
into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. When did imperfection enter the world with Adam? God created a perfect world. See, when God created it, it was good. It was perfect. The world that God created didn't have disease, decay. Our bodies didn't naturally age. None of the things that we just talked about that a natural humanist would say kills us existed. Though God made a perfect world. And through one man, it got blown to bits. It was ruined. Adam destroyed it. And through Adam, all of us inherited the world that got cursed we inherited his attitudes, we inherited his nature, we inherited the imperfe imperfections of our souls, the imperfections of the ground, the imperfections of the weather, the imperfections of our, all of it. We inherited that from the first Adam. But verses 15 and 16 of Romans chapter 5 describe someone else. Romans chapter 5, verses 15 and 16 says this, But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And that gift is not like that which came through the man who sinned. For on the one hand, judgment arose from the one transgression, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift the salvation that Jesus is supposed to provide arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Jesus came to reset this. Jesus came to fix it. Jesus came to do something about the fact that the world was broken, it was imperfect, and it caused death. Jesus came to do something about that problem. And that's why we call him the second Adam. But how does he do it? That's the next question. How does Jesus fix this thing? We need to understand that Jesus, in one way, is nothing like us. In one way, Jesus is nothing like us. We talked about Jesus being called the Word. Actually, the, the original word is Logos. We're going to go to John chapter 1 real quick. John chapter 1. Verses 1 through 3. I'm going to ascribe something to you. Maybe this will be an epiphany for you. I hope it is. I hope this is something that kind of goes, wow, I've never thought of it that way before. Jonathan, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that came into being came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. And then if we skip to verse 14... It explains who this word is. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's how John introduces Jesus. John introduces Jesus as this word. And he talks very specifically about creation, doesn't he? He talks very much about that in creation, Jesus was involved. I don't know if you've ever read the creation account and put that concept back in. But it's really interesting. If we go back to Genesis 1, say 1, chapter 3, check this out. Then God, God the Father, said, does anyone in this room speak? Any speakers in the room? Everyone who can talk. I, no one raised their hand, okay. But I'm, I'm assuming everyone in this room can talk. I'm assuming that everyone in this room is an expert on speaking. You're pretty good at it. What do we use to speak with? Words, right? Words. We speak with words. We could say, we could say, Josh said, go outside. Or we could say, Josh used words to convey, go outside. And they would both mean exactly the same thing, right? The word said, and the word said, and use words to convey is exactly the same meaning. So here we are in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. God the Father, God the Son. God said. 
The Word is right there. When God spoke, there's Jesus. You see, the will and the method. It's, it's every single time, we can just keep going, every single time it's God said, it is God the Father, God the Son. Then verse 9, then God, God the Father, said, God the Son, let the waters... You see, Jesus is over and over and over and over, and every single time we have the word God and the word, have we have the word said, they're both there. God the Father's there, and God the Son is there, and it doesn't stop there. Every time we go through the entire Old Testament and we see God said, there's God and there's Christ. This should open up your mind to the relationship and the, and the duality and the cooperation between the Father and the Son that is inseparable. That permeates everything that God ever did. The difference, one of the ways we conceptualize the Father and the Son is the will and the action. It's not, it's not perfect. There's limits to this. The, the, the Trinity is hard. I know that. But, but one of the ways to conceptualize this is to understand that this is part of the, the, it is an aspect of the Father to will things. It is the aspect of the Son to do things and to make things happen. So we have God said and God said twice. Those are this God two times in a row. Suddenly, Jesus is all over. I could preach a whole sermon on this. But God's voice is that voice that has the power to create, the power to destroy, and the very definition of truth. That's who Jesus is. Jesus is the aspect of God's will hitting the ground and doing things. Our plight was so dire that we needed this level of power, God himself, to rescue us. When we talk about who Jesus was, it's God's will itself, this power that made stars and planets and water and birds and fish. We needed that level of power to save us from our imperfection. That's how bad our situation was. Our situation was so horrible that our imperfection required that level of oomph. When Jesus' followers talked about Jesus, they immediately were drawn to this aspect of who Jesus was, this, this godly aspect. This is why they called him the Son of God. In this concept, again, we have a translation problem because we say son of, and we only think of this physical relationship of, of giving birth to, so that's my son. And yet in the original language, it's way more complicated than that. It's more... It's, it includes that, but it also means type of, representative of, of the same kind as. All of those concepts and aspects are involved with son of, and we lose them all because in English it just means, well, that's the dad and that's the kid. But in the original language, it was, it was far more complex. It meant so much more. And so when they say son of God, they don't just mean God was the father and he birthed you. He means you are you are of the same type. You are of the same kind. There is God and you are God also. That's what Son of God meant. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the very beginning of his gospel, he starts with the Son of God. If you'd like some more examples, you could go to Mark 2, 10 through 11, Mark 8, 13, Mark 4, 62, and that's just one of the books of the Bible. There are many more examples. His followers called him the Son of God. They looked at him and saw God. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, though. As we read through the New Testament, there's this, there's this trend. His followers, and even some un, uninteresting people, like very interesting people, like the person up on the cross next to Jesus who says, Surely this is the Son of God, or the centurion that recognizes, surely this is the Son of God. We have interesting people who go, you're God. 
But when Jesus refers to himself, he doesn't use that. Jesus doesn't say of himself, son of God. Jesus says of himself, son of man. Why? Why do other people look at Jesus and say son of God, but Jesus talks about himself and he says son of man? What's that about? Well, it means all those same, same things that I just talked about. It means type of, representative of, of the same kind as man. When Jesus looked at himself, he didn't see God. When he looked at himself, he saw his primary motive, purpose, being to represent us. Jesus looked at himself and said, I am a type of you. I am a representative of you. I am of the same kind as you. And if Jesus sees himself that way, that's the way God the Father sees him. And so the Father looks down at Christ and he doesn't see God. The Father looks down at Christ and sees us. And so we look at Christ and we see God and God looks at Christ and he sees us. And this is direly and super important because this is how the plan starts to come together. You see, if we go back to that word Emmanuel that means God with us, way back at the beginning when we were in Matthew, what does that have to do with Jesus, God saves? You see, Jesus is God saves. Emmanuel is God with us. Now the two of them are not, it's not that they sound the same, it's that the concepts complement. Jesus saves by being with us. Every single time someone said, Son of God, that's the same concept as Emmanuel. By the way, in two different languages. Emmanuel did not work in Aramaic. And so, so the, really, Emmanuel is God with us. Son of God is, there's God with us. They're the same idea. In other words, every single time someone says Son of God, conceptually they were saying Emmanuel. So every single time you read in the New Testament, Son of God, you're reading the concept Emmanuel. Jesus was called the concept Emmanuel, just not the word And yet, though God was with us, when God looked at Christ, he saw us. And this allowed something brand new to happen. Because Jesus was perfect. And for the first time in all of history, someone managed it. Someone who was human hit the mark. Someone who was human was perfect, did do it right, did manage it, did live to ever live, manage to live every single second of their life properly. Someone finally managed to do it perfect. Someone finally became our champion and they didn't have to die for the first time ever. There was a human being that didn't have to die. And you know what he did? He died. And this is really where it all comes down to. You want to know who killed Jesus? The one who didn't have to die. The most religious, hardest triers in the world. The people that were giving it everything they had to be perfect, that wanted desperately to be perfect, that were criticizing other people for not being perfect, that were making more and more rules all the time in an effort to get someone to be perfect, to try to make themselves perfect, and believe finally somehow that they were perfect. The people that killed Jesus were the ones most focused on being perfect. Pharisees, the chief priests and the scribes of the Jewish people, the most religious people you could ever hope to meet in your entire life. In their pride, in their desire to earn God's favor, they could not stand the real thing. They were insulted 
by this. They were insulted by the idea that they needed saving. How about you? Are you insulted by the idea that you need saving? Are you angered by the idea that you aren't good enough? Are you disinterested in any God who wouldn't realize what a nice person you are and just forgive you and let you in exactly the way things are? Does that offend you and bother you? The irony is, is that God will love you and take you just the way you are. There is nothing keeping anyone from having peace with God except one thing. They don't think they need it. Or they don't want it. It's the only thing that can keep you from receiving the perfection and the grace and the gift that Jesus offers is a decision, I don't need it or I don't want it. Because no one can be perfect. So if it was based on his being perfect, no one would get it. It's not. It's based on the fact that Christ was perfect. And he finally purchased what nobody else had the capacity to purchase. God offers eternal life as a gift bought by the only person who ever lived that could afford to buy it. And we called him Yeshua, which means God, um, God saves. And we called him Emmanuel, God is with us. And we call him the second Adam because he fixed what the first Adam totally screwed up. And we call him the Son of God because when we look at him, we see God. But we also call him the Son of Man because when God looks at him, he sees us and allows him to take our place and allows him to be in our stead and allows him to pay that price because when he looks at Jesus, he sees us, but he sees us perfected. We call him these things and we use these words, but those of us who are Christians in this room, sometimes we need to remember what these words mean because we throw them around like this and we don't really think about the depth and the weight and the power of the words we say. Thank you, Father, for sending us your salvation from imperfection by coming to be with us, for creating new life for your people by representing God to us and representing humanity to yourself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for this gift. Lord, in you, you came here and you, you had prophesied it. Lord, there are, there are so many prophecies that came perfectly true. In Christ. Things that have been written thousands of years prior and they came out exactly right. And today, today we live grateful that our goal is no longer to try to be perfect. Our goal is no longer to to look at other people and demand that they're perfect. Our goal is no longer to blame somebody because it's not perfect. Our goal is now to look to you because you are perfect. And it's to gratefully accept Christ's perfection on our behalf and allow your grace, your power to change us to grow us, to do things in us that we never could have done so that one day we will be in heaven and we will be perfected as you are. Lord, we can't even imagine it. And all the things that the secular humanist God think that it would take to have an eternal life, we will have it all. We will have that. We will have physical bodies that don't decay. We'll have an, a, an environment that is perfectly balanced. We will eat what we should eat. We will drink what we should drink. And we will treat each other as we shall treat e should treat each other. And we will live forever. But Lord, perfection is only found in you. And our imperfection just kills us. Lord, would you cause us to live in dependent faith always realizing where the solution comes from 
humble because we know that we don't bring anything to the table. Loving because that's your example. And believing because there is no hope in ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.